G'day punters and welcome to Tabs Inside 50. I'm Nick Quinn and as per usual, the star of the show, the 305 game superstar from Hawthorne, Shane Crawford. And Crawford, once again, more Tasmanian football royalty this week. Oh no, surely not. <laughs> um, it's incredible the talent that comes out of Tasmania. Can I introduce this guy? Is that okay? Absolutely. All right. Well, it gives me great pleasure, and maybe I maybe I'll take over from you, Quinny. Uh, it gives me great pleasure <laughs> introducing uh, this man. Who, well, do you know what? When I think of a menu, I think of a mixed grill because he's done it all. He's you know been a coach, a player. He's a prankster, which a lot of people don't know. Uh, he can get very serious, which is very controversial these days. You're not allowed to get serious as a coach. Um, but he's seen it all. He's coached some of the all-time greats, including Tony Lockett. He's played with some of the all-time greats, another key forward, Jason Dunstall. So I'm sure we'll get a bit out of him. But please welcome to the show, Rocket, Rodney Eade. How are you? Hi, Shane. Hi, Quinny. I think you might put me out of a job then. That was a very good intro. Oh, he's done well. He's done well. He I has didn't really promoted like himself stats, extremely well, though. <laughs> <laughs> I have for a while, but I've shut it down. <laughs> are you well? Very good, thank you. Very good. Yeah? Very good. Enjoying life, so... Yep. My hair's growing back after um, after, after <laughs> well, getting rid of coaching. <laughs> During your playing days, you, you had a bit of hair, didn't you? I had the mullet, as we all did in those days. So um, had the flowing locks, but uh, and the porno moustache. Had the said. porno mo. There was a few of us there back in those <laughs> days. In the in the eighties, was very much the had the moustache. But uh, why, why were the moustaches so popular back then? Oh, I got no idea, mate. We're just sheep. We just followed the trend. I suppose I don't know why. Everyone had a moustache, didn't yeah. they? It's, yes. Uh, then it went the handlebar moustache, move and yeah. Chopper Reed and those sort of guys, and uh, yeah, eventually then I went to North Melbourne as assistant coach, and I soon no, I soon got it off. It wasn't the trend. I used to get bagged by my mates, so that was enough. <laughs> now, in that introduction, Shane mentioned you was a prankster. True or false? Oh yeah, I was a bit of a bit of a light-hearted uh, guy. Uh, there was a few of us around. I think I think that happens in most footy clubs, isn't it? There's a there's a blend of guys who. Love to muck around. I suppose when I first went there, there was a now now I think there was a lot of guys like that, and you had your serious blokes like the Don Scotts, and <laughs> and had you know you had Lee who was very quiet and introverted, but uh, there was you now there's a lot of guys. A lot of us used to play some tricks and um, uh, bag each other and come up with nicknames and those sorts of things. That that is interesting when you think about it. You got Don Scott in one side with Lee Matthews. You play with Jason Dunstall. You know Dermot, Johnny Platten, Dermot Brown, and Dipper. Wow, all oh, shy Langford. guys, all oh, shy guys, no egos at all. Chris Langford, <laughs> Gary Ayres, yeah, uh, Chris Mew. It, it's it's incredible, really, when you think about the the talent that you played uh, yeah. with. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, that was very fortunate when I first went there. Obviously, Tucky uh, as well. And Peter Knights is one of the best of all time, and Martello, Kelvin Moore, and then as you said, Dermot and Jason, um, Ayersy, Langers, Platts, um, Dip. Dip was there when I first went there, but uh, Gary Bacanara was a star. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was very fortunate to play in a great footy club, but certainly a great team. Growing up in Tassie, from what age did you think I'm pretty good at this caper or I might be able to go far with it? Uh, not till I went to Hawthorne, um, actually, because I was a cricketer probably as a youngster. So that was probably my... All-rounder? Uh, Oh, I thought oh. I was an all-rounder, but mainly a batsman. Yes. Um, used to bowl nude nuts. Had nothing on them <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, so, that, yeah, because I played just a cricket at 14 in, in Tassie um, and played under 19 carnivals for a while. And then my first year at senior footy was with Glenorchy, with Peter Hudson as coach, or captain coach. So you grew up in Hobart? Yeah, Hobart. Yep. So and that was my team. Or I suppose my local side, Dad played there. Um, the black and white suburban footy, working class suburb, and um, uh, so I played one year at, uh, at Glenorchy, which fortunately I had a good year, we had a good year, you know, we won that what was called the State Premiership, there's just three leagues, and we won that, and went to that Australian Club Championship in Adelaide that they held, so that's North Melbourne, West Perth, and Nord, and Hutto recommended me to Hawthorne, North Melbourne looked at me apparently, because Daryl Sutton was playing as well on the team, but uh, I must have had a bad day, they never spoke to me, <laughs> and... Uh, so Hawthorne was really the option, and I thought I'd go for a couple of years and then come back home. So I didn't really... I, I suppose you have dreams of playing AFL footy, or VFL it was in those days, but you, you know, I was only a skinny kid. I was only, only 11 stone at the, at the stone, probably 70 kilos. And I never thought I'd make it, so I went uh, went to Hawthorne, very homesick. Uh, those lasted a couple of years, played in the premiership in the first year, and obviously stayed. 
And when you first come over, who, where did you live? Who did you live with? Any players or no, 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 oh. no. It's interesting. You know, I talk to people about the the modern player in the last ten years. The poor little darlings don't want to get drafted to interstate, and <laughs> I don't want to leave mum, and mm. and they get everything. And please spot. don't yell at me. Oh, coach. yeah, please. Oh, jeez. <laughs> And if we'll you give ask me, you about that later. And if you, you give me fee- if you give me feedback, I only want positive feedback. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, I don't want I don't need room for improvement. Um, but I used to um, I lived in Box Hill North and went to Blackburn South High School uh, my first year and used to get a, a bus then a train to um, to school and the same to Glenfrey Oval after mm-hmm. school and then get a ride home with Brian Cook, who's now the CEO of Carlton. He was playing at Hawthorne and his two tone balloon F. Bl- Blue FC Holden, where there's smoke coming out of it. So every time I see Cookie, I remind him of my tri- our trips home. Um, so that was my top. You know, that was my lot in my in my first year. So you have to study for VCE. It was HSC as it was then. Um, also get yourself to training and play. And uh, yeah, so they, no, they wanted to meet a board with a, a lady who some other guys are boarded with over the time. Country recruits and Ian Payton, um, obviously Tasmanian. He was the year before me. And he said, no, nah, don't go and live there. He said, it's horrible. So <laughs> I said to the club, I'm not living there. Because <laughs> she was bursa at the school. So I actually, oh, right. and uh, so I went and lived with a family in Box Hill North. <laughs> and you had to grow up quickly? Yeah, you do. I mean, in those in those days, uh, yeah, that because you have to fend for yourself in many ways. I mean, the club were great compared to other clubs in the welfare. I hate the word welfare, but in looking after you. Um, what you hear of other clubs were you know, actually doing at the time, but it's nothing like today. It's poles apart. And then we had the great John Kennedy as coach, which was um, uh, very physical training. Um, it's uh, very tough uh, man-on-man stuff. I remember one of my first nights, I had a new pair of Adidas boots, which were tough plastic type, the cheapest ones you could get, they gave me. And, um, and I had blisters. We're doing a fair bit of running. And I thought, I'll go and tell John, and I've got big blisters on the on my heels. <laughs> and Mark Scott, who played at Hawthorne, then went to St Kilda and Fitzroy, um, was just starting at the same time, and he went up to John and said, oh, I've got blisters, John. He said, that's okay, Mark. He said, just run 15 laps and then you can go in. And I thought, oh, perhaps my blisters are okay. <laughs> <laughs> And another story about John, which was, oh, I've got heaps of stories about John, he was fantastic. But when he came back as chairman selectors to Alan Jeans, he, him and Jeans were quite good friends, and Yab was coaching his, his first year. I remember we were playing an intra club practice match at Glenfrey Oval, and um, it, you know, it was Browns against Yellows, and we had the VFL umpires. And I was at half back flank, and it seemed to need an inordinate amount of time before the, you know, before the game started. And, I think, and John's on the, on the Linda Crescent side, great booming voice. What's going on, umpires? What are you doing? They said, oh, John, we haven't got a ball. Don't worry about that. Blow the whistle and get the game going. (laughs) 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 I stood there laughing. I can't go. Everyone else laughing. It was was John. Now, Shane Crawford played a premiership in his 305th and final game. You played in a flag in game number nine. It all came around very quickly. That's greedy. Yes, I must admit, it's all, it's all the sliding doors moment, isn't it? It's all timing, it's luck. Um, I know the barrack for Collingwood would have gone to Collingwood. They finished last that year. You like so, the Jake Bowie yeah, coming into Melbourne. Yeah, very much so, I suppose. Uh, so it was my ninth game. The start of the year, Peter Manane, because I was a winger in those days, was best on ground the first game of the year. I thought, oh, I'm not going to get a game. Stuart Trott came back from injury. They tried uh, a whole range of different players and... I can't remember whether it's form or injury or whatever for players are out. And I got my game, my first game in round 16 against Carlton. It was a big game we lost. Didn't do much. Um, and then fortunately played a good game the next game or two and fortunately be able to stay in. So, yeah, I, I don't think you realise the enormity of the situation at the time. And I think you, as I got older, and as you would appreciate when you, at your age, I mean, my last one was at 28, and you appreciate that more than you did the, the first one or first two because it happened so quickly. And you're just playing a role on a team and things fell off, fell that way. Um, but fortunately then, you now we won one on another two years after that. But you were playing a running role too, so you obviously had good endurance. Yes, I was reasonable endurance. I wasn't one of the top five or six. I probably had more speed and probably, you know, that I could read the game okay. Um, Footy, uh, as far as aerobic, I probably could have pushed myself a bit harder. Shane, I think I. Now we in those days used to do the uh, the four k time travel, not the not the two k. Mine was best was about fourteen fifteen, 
But I always used to try and get fourteen forty five or something like that just yeah. to just to get under the barrier. <laughs> that's, that's sort of it. And I'd always come back pre season when we'd start in November and we'd have time trials. I always made sure my first one was my slowest and then build it up slowly. So the time March came they thought, Oh well he's worked hard over. Well it's it sort of when I started, you know, some of the older players, you know, they were very much that way. They're like, nah, not showing our hand first time trial today. No, nah, no. Nah. They'd be out the back and they obviously they would gradually improve, you know, as the season went. But there's something in that. You train too hard too early, you get to the start of the year, and yeah. then you've got to go and play 22 matches and you're mentally cooked. So you have to time good. yourself. Oh, for sure. And, and and I think there's some merit in what the Players Association are saying. I know a lot of coaches, I don't know my coach, but I, I wasn't a coach that said, well, we've got to be super fit by Christmas. I mean, I, I didn't see the benefit of players. I, I Always, I know you can never manage this because they get injuries in, in practice matches, but if you're about 95, 98% fit by first, by round one, games are going to take you up to match fitness. But sometimes, I know you can't get more than 100%, but if you do the needle too much in fitness work and you're already 100% by Christmas, if you do more, you load up, you're actually taking time away from schoolwork and go, you know, actual game plan. So I think there's, I think there's something in that. You were at Hawthorne for a great period in 1976 to 1987. You played in four premierships. Apart from all the top players, you mentioned some at the top of the show. What made the club so great? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think looking back, and you hear about these feedback mechanisms now, the leading teams and all that sort of stuff, which is quite raw, but Hawthorne sort of had that in, a, in its rawest capacity. And I think it was... I think the great John Kennedy started it all because they were embarrassment, or we felt they were embarrassment in the fifties, and um, Melbourne and, Con- and Melbourne Collingwood used to used to laugh at them and play tricks and all that sort of stuff and be and be smart, Alex. And John's a very competitive individual, so it made them tough. And the training that John did was very physical, as I mentioned before, but it was really brutal. And I think that set the tone about what Hawthorne was about, and therefore the baton was passed on, and the players would challenge you. If you didn't stand up in what they in what they valued, nowadays you have meetings and you write the thing your values on the on the board and then you're challenging the meeting. That was really done in its rawest form. So I think and team because John preached team and one of his sayings was team was first, second, and third. So it was all about the team, um, and I think that was in the you know, it was actually in the DNA in the in the mortar of the walls, and that's the that's the way you felt it. Um, and I think. Park and obviously Chase uh, obviously followed that on. David being a great Hawthorne man, um, and and then Genji was very similar to that as well. So it came from the top. Um, um, you now they had some, there were some healthy egos, and there was you now there was guys who played up at times, and I think I think the same with all footy clubs. But it but it really came through that team was first. We're here for success, and guys worked hard to do that. When you play with someone like a Dermot Bird and when he's rocking up on a Harley Davidson one day and then he's coming in a beautiful, shiny, fast car, Ferrari or Lamborghini, you know, it, there's something about it. There's something that, um, I don't know, with Dermot, it, you just can't help but like someone Dude. like that and it just lifts the spirits, you know, because you go, no, nah, I wouldn't operate like that, but something within he's him He's a very engaging everyone. character. Yeah. He? That smile, you can see on telly, he's a... And he really, like, he, he he has got a huge ego, but it's a lovable ego. It's not a, it's not a, some guys have got egos that are just a pain in the backside and you say, well, you don't want to know about you. But, but interesting with Derm, when he first started, and this didn't get sold, he was the bogan from Frankston. He would try and dress, he'd try and buy some nice clothes, and he'd have the worst shoes in the world. <laughs> and say, so, what crap are you wearing, Dermot? And he'd go, what do you, what, you know, what do you mean? I said, what are those, those shit shoes? You wouldn't wear them out to a shit fight. And he goes, oh, okay, I need to. So, he, he so just, he's he, taking he, fashion advice from someone from Tasmania. Who had no idea either. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to bag him. <laughs> and um, I say, like, you can't. Well, he had the red hair, didn't he? he had the, he had the, the red, red hair, hair initially. Yeah. and, and uh, but, he, but, but he was full of life. You know, he was engaging. Everyone, everyone loved him. Everyone loved playing with him yep. because he was, you know, super competitive. But, you know, as he... As he grew um, in age and grew up, it was more the personality came for media and uh, that sort of thing. So he was doing TV and those sort of things. And we used to bag him about that, but that didn't worry him. Yeah. But he was very good at bagging too. He was fantastic at doing it. He was, <laughs> he was, he was an ex- but he was a great teammate. He was a fantastic teammate. And uh, he um, obviously kicked, what, four or five in his first game. And, um, and 
he only won the one best and fairest. And I suppose Peter Knights was the other one. Peter should have won more best and fairest. Peter and Tucky didn't win any. But um, Knights, he was a superstar. And and the Derm was like that as well. Um, but, uh, you know, Derm and his footy would have a lot of down patches. Like, he'd have two, three, four games in a row where he wouldn't do much. Like, he was very small for a centre forward. Yeah. Very small. You have a look at his legs. Like, it's it's a skeleton with a pie thrown out Duke of his car. Yeah. Yeah. He's, <laughs> he's, snap him. Yeah, exactly. So, but he got big and... Um, and he was strong and, you know, he was tough. And I think in the end that's obviously played in his body when he was, you know, he virtually finished at 28, 29. Throughout your Hawthorne career personally and as a team so successful, I think the one speed hump you probably hit as a player was being dropped for a grand final when your form was arguably as good as it had ever been. Yes, uh, that was 85. That was a real kick in the in the backside. I, the week before in the preliminary final, I got votes in the media, as well as the best and fairest. So I played, I did play well. So I had no inkling that I was going to get dropped. There was no feedback mechanism or discussion about it. Um, so I we went to the grand final parade on the Friday. Still training. didn't know? No, still didn't know. Oh, grand final parade, I'm up and about. Parents are flying over from Tassie. Oh. Get to, back to Glenfrey Over, where we had our team meeting, uh, generally, so four o'clock, and yeah, pulled me aside and said, you're not in, son, we're not going with you. It wasn't the time for me to challenge that and ask why and have a discussion. And I said, oh, no, I'll come in the meeting. So I stunned. I didn't know what. So I got out. Um, parents were already on the plane. whole range of different emotions, as you'd imagine. I had the, had the shits and said, well, I'm not going to go. I oh, know because the seconds were going to play that next day as well, um, the grand final. So um, I said, I'm not going to turn up. Then I thought, oh, well, I'm the only one that's going to lose out of that. I'll go and I won't try. I don't care. Uh, so, uh, no. And as I walked on the ground, I said, oh, no, it's best to... Because Knightsy was playing, Bucky was playing, Michael Byrne. There were some really good players playing in the seconds. And, wow. Uh, that's, that's an incredible seconds yeah. when you think about and, it. And uh, Chris Whitman was young. Um, dear Jimmy Morrissey, the freak, was playing. Um, I think the side was that good in the seconds. So Brett Lovett, who played 180 games for Melbourne and played for Victoria, was an emergency for the twos. Jeez. Oh, my goodness. Well, there was a great history with, you know, Hawthorne blooding, you know, the players who deserved to be in the seniors, but not kept them in for an extra couple of seasons yeah, just I think, to get the grounding. And then... I think Tucky played 50 or 60, 70 yeah. um, seconds games. Dipper did. I think Jimmy Morrissey did. Um, nowadays, those players would be disenchanted and say, well, I want to play senior footy and they'd actually go and the salary cap and those sorts of things. But in those days, you could keep them. There wasn't a mechanism really for players to go that was all control of the, of the clubs. Uh, so I went along and I think uh, now they gave me the captain for the day as a token gesture. Um, we ended up beating Carlton who had Glascott and English and Rod Austin and that sort of um, situation. So, And I watched the seniors privately, fingers crossed, hoping they'd lose. Yep. And uh, they got belted. So that they put David O'Halloran in for the first game for the year um, to play on Salmon. Salmon was yep. at the height of his... Uh, powers at that stage or, or actually heading towards height of his powers so I can understand that but I thought there were other players who were playing my sort of role that I, I could probably be in the side Were you tempted to leave on the back of that? Obviously you're glad you didn't you stayed you played in further premierships but was that a bit of a sliding doors moment? That was the start of it obviously it was the biggest issue and then in 86 I got dropped a couple of times which happens and I think your ego gets pricked and you probably think you're better than what you are um, then got back in and Played well in the final series and played in, played in the in the grand final on the premiership. Eighty seven got dropped again, and I thought, again, ego, just thing. And then Knightsy was coaching the Bears, and said, "Would you interested in coming up there?" And I said, "Yeah, I would." So, so that was that was how that happened. That was at the end of the eighty seven season, and then from eighty eight on, this would be a theme song. Gee, I must admit, I've never sung that very well. <laughs> 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 when he <went> going. <laughs> How motivational Crawford wants to run out That's after hearing not that. a bad song, yeah. I, I never heard it a great deal as well, obviously. Didn't win a lot of matches, but when you think about it, you've done so much. You go to Sydney, you go to Gold Coast, you're in Melbourne, you're in Hobart. Um, you've certainly seen a lot, which is great. So how was that starting up a, a new club and trying to be competitive? How, how 
and not only that, you're travelling as well. Yeah. So no one had their sports science back then. It's just more or less, oh, we'll just butter up next week. So how did you cope with all of that? Yeah, I, I went in there second year. So I started the year before in 87. And then 88, it was myself, Rod Lester Smith from Hawthorne, Roger Merritt and Scott McIver from Fitzroy. So um, I put the start. So it was interesting going there that the club had been started up, which was poorly set up by the VF on those days, that clubs could had to nominate two players to go to the best. And generally, they players who were retiring. Mm-hmm. Carlton gave a player who was going to be a doctor in London um, or the they were, yep. now the guys who were obviously at the back end. So they really, really was a mishmash. The guys were terrific guys, but quite a few of them had some good talent, but they lacked the motivation to be actual professional footballers. And so they... I think they won their first two or three games under night. So they did a really good job and then eventually... I think yep. the social life kicked in a bit too much. and oh, So yeah. so going there the second year was about trying to rectify that, I suppose. Um, uh, but it was really difficult, yeah. And th- that was the... Was that Christopher Scase days? Yeah, Christopher Scase was uh, the owner. And Paul Colourful Cronin. character. Paul Cronin was the... Paul Cronin. Uh, was the chairman. And, um, the Sullivans. That's <laughs> it, yeah. I um, didn't mind it <laughs> as a show. <laughs> uh, Scase we didn't see a lot. And then he obviously had his issues, financials and... Taking people's money and whatever, so uh, they changed ownership uh, because Knights. I know Knights. You got the sack under under Pellerman. Uh, then Ruben Pellerman um, became the owner, um, and then Knights. You got the sack. Paul Feltham became coach, and for whatever reason, I think because Paul just took the shackles off. But uh, I won't go into too much detail. But Paul didn't have much idea on footy, but he was he was a bit of a, a bit of hot gospel in many ways. And um, we won four out of seven or something. Then there was a player revolt and a revolt internally about getting rid of Paul Feltham. He promised four blokes, just an example, four guys that they'd be captain the next year. So he was saying different things to different players and there was a bit of that. So anyway, so that... Maybe he was ahead of his time with multiple captains. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe he was. And uh, so then he got the sack in the February and Norm Norm Dare took over and they had no money. So there was no recruits. Um, so it was difficult times um, in yep. that, and uh, I think it's all part of the learning. And then uh, the end of end of that, no, that's right. Norm, Norm became coach, and they had the seconds in the AFL, and he, I was still playing. But he wanted a senior player to be coach of the seconds, which is incredulous, really, about you know how you prepare for a game, you got to coach the two. So it's between. Oh, they wanted me and Choco Williams to do it together. And the board, in their infinite wisdom, said, no, we only want one. Choco said, no, I want to concentrate on my playing. And I didn't really want to do it. It was really that sliding doors moment. So it was a worse decision, football decision, to go there. But it was actual career decision. It worked out OK. So Norm forced me to coach the twos. As luck would have it, I hurt my knee, um, my MCL, about round four or five. Missed 10 weeks. Could concentrate on coaching the twos. Came back playing the twos. Really enjoyed that. Um, and then retired at the end of that year, uh, and then coached the twos the next year as well. Imagine that coaching the twos while you're still running around. Oh, three quarter time of the seconds, I had to go down <laughs> yeah, and prepare exactly. for the second game. Hang on, <laughs> I've got to get, go and get ready. That's real old school, isn't it? It's fantastic. And, but when did Warwick Kappa come along? Uh, the wizard came. So, so you didn't have money, but somehow Warwick Kappa well, appears. Well, well, now there wasn't money after Skase went. Right. Um, so they started eighty seven. I went in eighty eight. Warwick came in 89, and I think Skase then finished at the end of 89, I think, um, towards the end of 89. So, they, you know, they, so that caused a few uh, fractions, uh, fractious relationships because... Because he was a colourful character at Warwick? Oh, I think, or I think just, money. Oh, I think money, a few yeah, players yep. with their ego said, well, why is he getting more money than us? Instead of just well, saying... Because well, he, he can play and kick goals? Yeah, well, he didn't do that. <laughs> 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 yeah, but he didn't do that because it didn't... They didn't kick to him, did they? No, is I that, don't. Is that not true? Well, I think two things there. One, the SCG is a smaller ground. Mm. Warwick couldn't lead. He, he wasn't a leader as far as leading for the ball because he couldn't read the game. Yep. So it was just mark and jump. She had Williams, Healy, Mitchell, and they'd kick it on heads and that sort of thing. So Warwick could do that. Bigger ground because Carrara is a big ground. Uh, or Metricon now. It's a big ground. So you've got to get your leading patterns right. We weren't as good a side. 
So there was times that he's running to the wrong spot. So I think it was not just yeah. so much players didn't kick it to him. He's probably in the wrong spot, and we weren't as good a team. So uh, he, he's a very lovable character. Though, he Warwick. is. He is a lovable rogue, isn't he? Yeah. He is. He is. He's a simple soul in many ways, and he's got his spiel that he keeps saying consistently over and over. <laughs> Do you miss me? Do you miss me? Yeah, he's got he? that. He's got that song he sings. Um, uh, with, uh, I don't know. Anyway, I'll think of it. Something about Capo. <laughs> Yeah, Kepa, like, Kepa, like anyway. Yeah, but he's he, yeah, but he, he was, look, he, look, he was, I for for a guy who came there under the under the deal he did, and then there was some tension. He was very good with supporters. He he would he would kids would queue up for an hour and he'd sign everything. He was really involved in that way. I just, just think from a football point of view, it was probably the wrong decision for him football wise to go there. Yeah, I used to um, when when he obviously finished, he would still come to Melbourne. And he would stay with Ron Barassi because I lived next door to Ron Barassi. Oh right, I was okay. in an apartment, and Ron lived in uh, a little, a beautiful townhouse next door. You know, I was in yeah. a dodgy apartment in St <laughs> yes, Kilda. So, I'm with you. <laughs> so <Central>. Warwick, <laughs> I used to see Warwick every couple of months, and he'd obviously come down to stay, but he'd stay with Ron Barassi, and then I'd go over to Kentani Gardens or go for a walk or you know get some fresh air, and then Warwick would be there. And he seriously would have his tight red oh, spray painted Sydney on. Swans footy shorts on, and he, and he'd have a uh, cut off tank top, and uh, yeah, get a crop. Hey, Wiz, how are you, mate? What's happening? He's just going, just doing a bit of a walk, you know. But you know, if Ron's watching, he doesn't like me running or walking on the roads, so I've got to do it on the grass. So even then, obviously, Ron's philosophy was don't run on the roads, don't run on the cement, always yeah. go on the grass, even when you're walking. Yeah. So even when, obviously, Warwick had been retired yeah. and using his house as a boarding house when he came to Melbourne, yeah. um, he'd make him walk on the grass, but yeah. uh, wandering around in his nice tight shorts. Yeah. And I can imagine Warwick being a colourful character – he might he might have dragged a few back to Ron's house at, at there might have some been. stage would have been you quite interesting next skin, door. He had those leopard skin shorts <laughs> and leopard skin stuff. Uh, yeah, poor old Ron would go, hey, what's He's happening in, here? <laughs> <laughs> Ron comes down for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen you before. Worry, you what doing? are you doing here, son? <laughs> <laughs> the final capper question for me does relate to women in his life. His wife at the time at the Brisbane Bears, is it true she gave the players a spray one time for not kicking in the ball? Um, the only time I saw that uh, was a certain player um, that she went up to and uh, verbally attacked for that. Was it you, was it? No, not me. No, no, no. I got okay with her. I didn't get enough of the ball, so that was all right. <laughs> um, and so he fought back. He, he he gave her a mouthful as well. So there was a few was swear cool. words going on and back on some Is forwards. In the change room? No, no, in the oh, no, after match, okay, after yeah. that, upstairs. Yep. So... Yep. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was on for young and old there. So, yeah, it was true. <laughs> that is unbelievable. What was the biggest difference between playing at Hawthorne and playing at Brisbane? And I'm not talking about on the field, but everything off it. Well, I think it's... I mean, I think it's one just playing in Melbourne versus, you know, v Queensland um, because of the... Because it's very easy up there. And I think people ask you now why the, the Bears... You know, or why anyone, any team on the Gold Coast doesn't work. And... It's very, especially when you've got so many young kids, they can escape. They don't get any criticism. Even if your coach doesn't hop into you, you go to the coffee, you know, Crawford, and someone's asking you a question. Mm-hmm. Why, did you, why did you lose that? Why, you know, here's my theory. Why, why, why don't they drop person? Why don't they drop Dipper? He's not playing well enough. Why don't, oh, you played a shit game on the weekend. So you're copying it all the time, and you're copying in the media. Well, there, you just don't get it. And I think that's the biggest difference. You can escape and just have a normal life. So it's like playing country footy. It's like you can't mm. turn up for training and you go and you go. You haven't got that intensity, I suppose, is what you get in Melbourne. Everyone's just thinking about, I'll get the jet ski because the sun's coming out this afternoon. And the, and and the weather's beautiful. Yeah, yeah it is. And it's it helps recovery. It's it helps recovery. I know. It's such a wonderful place to train, yeah. you know, and obviously recover. Um, but it is a very yeah. different environment. And the <laughs> AFL, they, even through the top of New South Wales and Queensland, you know, think, oh, AFL's really coming on. They've still got a lot of work to do oh, because yeah. you even read the papers. Where's the AFL news? No, that's on the Gold Coast Bullies, all about the league, rugby So league. there's no discussions in the cafe no. about AFL footy. No. No one really cares. No, that's right. They don't get recognised, which yeah. you can see in an egotistical way, but it's more the other way. It increases that intensity. I've got to perform. So you, I don't know what you're like, I, I'm, but I imagine you'd start thinking about the game on a Tuesday or Wednesday mm. about who I'm playing on, the way they play, and you get that feedback, and, and you might have had a bad game the week before, so you actually... Getting your mindset where there it's a bit more relaxed, 
you're not getting the intensity and you're probably not building up to Thursday, Friday. And yep. um, I don't know, flippant or lack of care is the right word, and I don't think it is, but it's just that intensity build-up that can actually... And that's why I think so many older players like going to Sydney mm. and Queensland at the end of their career because that intensity and scrutiny has worn them down. They want to be anonymous and want to enjoy the footy, and they can get themselves up each week. Yeah. Whereas a young player, you've got to learn that, how to actually motivate yourself to get that right each week. And they need that drive. Well, Luke Hodge went up, and he, he couldn't believe it. He's like, oh, he said, it's like I don't exist up here. Yeah. Um, so And obviously, he stayed up there. Yeah, you know? yeah, so yeah, there's yeah. definitely something in that. And you know whether it be players like, you know, if... if you know, I can understand why Buddy Franklin decided I need to get out of Melbourne, yep. you know, and whether or not it, it might be a Dustin Martin who says, hey, I might sort of head up to the Sydney way or even up to Queensland. So, um, But even my time, Plugger was obviously an example. Barry Hall, Wayne Swass all went to the Swans and they said they really like just like being anonymous. They can get themselves up each week because they're experienced enough and they pride in their performance and know, mm-hmm. what, know what needs to be done. But they like that being anonymous and they can just live their life. Where if you're an 18, 19, 20 year old kid, you go, well, how good's this? I can, I can do what I like. Yeah. So um, I think that's why there's success of those older players when they go there. Now you did coach the Brisbane Bears reserves to a premiership. Tell us about that day and it must have been something pretty special. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, that year, Robert Walls came to the Bears. Norm uh, helped f- actually facilitate uh, Rob getting there. And obviously it was a great thing for the Bears what actually happened when Rob, you know, they struggled a bit, but he, to help the seconds plight, not that he meant to, was he wanted to play kids. So halfway through the year, he made the decision, the older blokes are not going to take us anywhere. So they came back to the seconds. So that helped help the reserves team to be the team they want. But I think it, it, you know, it was a good fill up the club. Sean Hart was playing. There was a lot of Daryl White. You now there's a lot of youngsters from Queensland playing in the team. So I think playing in, um, playing in the Premiership helped a little bit for the club, um, a little bit on the Gold Coast. Not that that was sustainable, of course, but, um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think in that situation it was a real positive, yeah. And those players go on to be a part of, you know, the Brisbane Lions yep. sort of era, three in a row, you know. Sean Hart was vital. Yep. Um, White was a bit of a freak, really, yeah, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he was a freakish. Loved too. to talk. Yeah, he did love the talk. Well, he had that sort of uh, <laughs> staccato run up, and then, but he could have the have the jump, the vertical leap on him was fantastic. He was a great basketballer, so he had that touch. And, you know, he was a very quiet lad, Daryl. He was a nice lad. Now, from nineteen ninety six to two thousand and two, you coached the Swannies. Tell us about how that came about. Um, yeah, I, I'd coached North Melbourne. I'd been at North Melbourne for four years. I coached the flag there, uh, which was. Probably as good for my learning as well, being under Dennis. Um, certainly learnt a lot. Um, then at the end of 95, it was Fitzroy, Brisbane and the Swans. Uh, Fitzroy offered me the job and and I wasn't trying to be egotistical. I know it sounds egotistical, but I said, oh, listen, I hear you've got financial issues, which is not a big, but I'm hearing, a, are you going to survive? Can you just wait a few weeks? I've got these other teams. If I get that job, I'm going to take them. Yep. And they were good. They said, yeah, no worries. We'll, we'll sit and wait. I thought I'd get the Brisbane job, having been there. Um, but as it's turned out, uh, I went the Sydney. I met the Sydney. It was Kelvin Templeton, Rick Quaid, and a bloke called Greg Harris, who was the chairman of Selectors. Um, as a Sydney lad, and uh, met them here. Then went for a meeting in Sydney as a presentation, and then they flew me back up again um, a week or so later. And um, so here's your job. house at Bondi. No, uh, it wasn't like that. No, <laughs> no, no. Bought a little terrace house in Randwick, not far from the race course. Not that I'm a punter. A, li- a little, yeah. Randwick, no. a much sought after suburb where everyone is, wants to live. Just down the small, road from Bondo. They are very small houses though. A little, <laughs> five metres across. That was that was it. No parking, no garden. Just opposite Centennial Park there. No, no, not down Ooh. that far. Oh no, no, yeah, sure. No, no. Come on, mate. Just behind the dog. You know the dog. Duke of Gloucester Hotel? Yes. Just yeah. behind the dog. Not a so. bad spot. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably get one of those these days for 15, 20 mil. So. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> but when you think about your mentors from a coaching point of view, you know, playing days, John Kennedy, Alan Jeans, uh, then Robert Walls. Yeah, David Parkin. David Parkin. Dennis Pagan. Dennis Pagan. Unbelievable. Like, if you can't learn something from all those guys, they're all very different themselves. Yeah, they are. And I think that's the advice I always give prospective coaches is don't try and be like somebody else be yourself coach to your own personality some are uh 
uh, gregarious and that, that, that's your nature. Be that. So you have to be authentic. If you're quiet and you're just uh, measured, just be like that. You don't have to be like the great orator John Kennedy. And I, that, was, that scared me. That's why uh, when David became coach, and he was a great talker as well, I thought, she, she was, you have to be a great speaker. And I wasn't a great speaker. And I'm thinking, I don't want to coach. No, I know I don't want to coach, even though I had a reasonable idea on footy. And, and, I, and I threw David's, all his notes out. He was the first one to do reviews and great thought. And I said, no, nah, convinced myself that I wasn't going to be coach. So, uh, but looking back, yeah, yeah, I was certainly very fortunate. And, and Hawthorne were very fortunate to have those guys because Ginger was terrific. Uh, David, I think, the guy who's coached four premierships, so I think he gets a bit, not undersold, it's not the right phrase, but he doesn't get spoken in the Barassi and Hafey and Kennedy level. He can motivate you to eat a hamburger, yeah, he's David Parker. Yeah, great speaker, isn't he? Oh, like, can you tell me why I should eat this hamburger and all of a sudden yeah. you're launching the into it because, out. yeah, he does. You should be eating it because he, of this. And this. Because he's got great passion, he's yep. high intellect. And he's very scientific in his approach as well. But at the same time, he, he now he's one coach that can draw on emotion as well as science and that sort of thing. I suppose his only criticism of himself was that he wasn't a tactical person. But that's not the be all and end all either. But he was, he was a good coach. He was a good coach. So w- what about? Yourself, were you a quiet coach? Because I've heard some footage in the box of you uh, yelling yeah, like, at one stage against. I never used to yell a lot. And don't <laughs> tell me Clarkson Will didn't Minson. yell in the box. Have you been in the box with Clarkson? Never. No, yeah, I yeah. didn't. He wasn't a rant. Oh, a rant. Yeah. Oh, he was punching walls. So, <laughs> so is that why? Because it's it's a a tough job. You don't th- stop thinking about footy twenty four hours a day. No, no, no. From a coaching point of view, not that I've coached, but I can understand that. You take you your wouldn't. work home with you, yeah. yeah. And you stare at walls and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so... Um, family life suffers a bit. What about the incident with um, Will Mitz? I love it because it just shows it's a passionate coach. And you weren't alone, you know. You just happened to get, you know, have someone recording when you're actually yeah, in there saying... Have record. And the fact is, Will never heard it until yeah. when he heard the recording. Because <laughs> it's in the box, so it's not directed to his face. What was he doing wrong on the day? <laughs> well, he didn't want to come off. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd had the chat with have a chat with him for you, to the players. When you're told to come off by the runner, get off yep. as soon as you can because it affects our rotations. And uh, I said, get him off. <laughs> so I was actually abusing the runner. I wasn't. Abu- <laughs> I wasn't. Abu- he came across as well, but that was over a two and a half hour period, and they put it into a minute and a half. So I actually, no, I'm embarrassed about it, but I feel sorry for Will as well because I've. Oh, no, don't be yeah. embarrassed about it. It's an emotional game. So what? what what's the biggest spray you've ever given? I know Quinny was probably going to ask you at the end of the show, but so in the box, I was, and I tried. Is to- there a player there that you've just surely? Sure. You've gone, okay, right, I'm just going to absolutely blast away. Because you coached Tony Lockett. Do you ever blast him? No, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think the, um, as Rob Murphy said to me, he said, I think you're getting the, you know, actually get dealt a bad hand about, you didn't give as many sprays as people were saying. I said, no, I didn't really. Um, and a lot of it was theatre. You'd have an impact. And Well, we, ma- we had Ken Judge for a while, I'll tell you. Oh, what. yeah, well, he... And yeah, then I think Clarko, he, Clark, the biggest spray I've ever seen is Clarko half-time in the grand final... In 208, um, with Sam Mitchell, who was obviously the captain at the time, yeah. and Cameron Ling was tagging, and he hadn't got himself into the game. And I'm on the other side of the wall, and <laughs> I was fearing for Sam's life. Yeah. The, the, the way Clarko was ripping in, and, and then and I'm like, boys, we've got to get around Mitch, we've got to get him up, you know, because he'd come out going, oh, my God, I've never had a bigger – so, but you've got to pick your targets. Yeah, you do pick your targets, and you pick your – um, and the, the way you say it, some you don't, um, and some players respond to it. Like Brian Lake responded to it all the time. Yeah. But he needed him. Oh, you you know, you, oh, yeah, you've heard. Well, he, the he stories was, I hear out of Hawthorne, they say, oh, he's so much better at Hawthorne. Oh, he was exactly the same as Hawthorne as <laughs> he was at the Bulldogs. Like, he wasn't any different. And um, He just wasn't allowed to kick the ball yeah, as much. Yeah, he'd just kick off one step and it's like, what, train what when he wanted. And, <laughs> uh, and I, in the end, I said to Brian, because Brian and I had a pretty good relationship. He was quite funny, Brian, and I still kept in touch with him. And, and I said, Brian... I said, are you sick of me hopping into you? He said, yeah, I am. I said, I'm sick of doing it. I said, can you do what we ask? Yes. Can, yep. can you do what we ask and what your teammates want? Yeah, yeah, I'll try, I'll try that. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. I, yeah. I said, oh, thanks, Brian. That's all you've you got to do. <laughs> but I said to him, if, I'm, if, you do, if you're doing things that we're asking you not to do and I give you a serve and I get a response, what is that telling me? Yep. Telling me to give you a serve every time because I'm getting a response. There was one time because Brian used to fancy himself as a forward. He wanted to play full forward. So we were <laughs> playing the West Coast Eagles in Perth, and um, 
call seven o'clock in the morning, Saturday morning. Brian's woken up, physio. Brian's woken up with a bad back. Oh, really? He's got a bad back. Okay. Who was who was forward for West Coast at that time that he might have been playing on? Would have been you know someone that might have scared him a touch. No, no, no. no? He's, just no, a bit no, sore. No, he just sore. I said, you tell Brian if he gets himself up, I'll start him full forward. Sure enough, Brian right. <laughs> <laughs> Tim mentioned the first quarter, I put him to full back. Ah, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> So, the other time we are playing Hawthorne, <laughs> and you might have been playing, we are playing down in Launceston in 2008. Right. And um, both teams were undefeated about round 10. So we've had a draw, um, Hawthorne undefeated, and we're playing. Because we always wanted to say, Brian, don't kick on your left. Change pace, because he's quite quick, but he wanted to kick off one step and stop and want a short pass. And I said, just change pace yeah. and kick along. That's all we – just keep it simple. Anyway, so at three-quarter time, we're a couple of goals up. And it's quite, everyone's up and about and you're walking around place. And all of a sudden I hear this, I feel this tap on my left shoulder. <laughs> yeah, Brian, did you see that left foot kick I did? It was a bloody good kick, wasn't it? <laughs> and I could, I was nearly going to piss myself laughing. I said, piss off, Brian, will you? Leave me alone. <laughs> Uh, That's the sort of relationship yeah. we had. But he'd yeah. come up and, like, he was just happy with himself that his left foot kick hit the target and he was going to tell me about it. Yeah, yeah that's There were some other characters you coached along the way that would stand out like that, and they might not have necessarily been the best player, but they were fun for those reasons. Oh. Uh, fun and frustrating at the same time. There was a, there was a lot of them. Um, what, what about Tony Lockett, you know, trying to coach someone like that? Surely. I had a funny know, story about Tony. It's uh, He's a different character. Yeah. I, I, one. one well, yeah, about the Bulldogs, a guy called Shane Burse. He was from the country, very funny of Blake, and um, I was quite intense at times. And and I'm and I'm trying to give the analogy of cricket that if you're fielding in slips, you want the ball to come to you. So in football, want yep. the ball to come to you. Don't sit back and you know actually worry about mistakes. You know, back yourself. And I said, why does Shane Warne field in first slip? And Shane Burst, it's because he's fat and he doesn't want to run. <laughs> <laughs> and Robert Murphy looked at me, Robert Murphy said to me, oh, I don't know where this is going to go. And I just started laughing. I said, very good, Percy. That's all right. <laughs> um, but Plugger, you know, you, you, stories about him, you know, it's in Kilda and the punch of CEO and drink a six-pack of beer on the way to training and he didn't want to train. So Darryl Ca- Bulldog, I can't train tonight. Pulled a gun on uh, Michael Roberts yeah, when that, Channel 9 popped down. Yeah, it, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I often tell that story when I have a, when I do a sporty. About well, Spud was the one that kept telling me. I said, that's not true. No, so I no, asked Plugger. And no, he's I like, asked, oh, I might have. Yeah, might I asked Robo. Well, I, I, I say it's a shotgun, but it was only a twenty two. He <laughs> shot it above his head and probably put his pants right back to the helmet. <laughs> so you hear all these stories and you go, oh, God. But he was a fantastic coach and um, only had a couple of run-ins, which I feared for my life in both times. But um, but one story that I think is really funny and it sort of encapsulates him a bit, that um, uh, part of my coaching at the Swans, uh, the last meeting before the weekend, the I mean, team meeting, and I randomly asked, Two, three, four players. What they'd know about upcoming opponents, <laughs> because they, you, know, they, you know, because they get fed everything, information, edits, highlights, whatever it is, upcoming opponents. Um, and I wanted them to do their own own homework, and they didn't want to get embarrassed in front of their mates. Now, Plugger didn't know many players in the competition, let alone <laughs> opponents. He knew Steve Silvani, Mick Martin, <laughs> Alice Lynch was playing fullback, and he knew Ashley McIntosh. He'd played five times on Matthew Croft, and still didn't know who he was. Yeah, and right. He goes. So invariably going to these meetings, you know, Paul Kelly or Andrew Dunkley or Darren Cruz will come up and say, Rocket, can you ask Plugger today? Because we want to piss ourselves <laughs> laughing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no worries. Anyway, this one weekend we're playing the West Coast Eagles. <laughs> and sure enough, Kel comes up and says, Rocket, can you ask Plugger today? Dad, don't ask him about Macintosh. Can you ask him about somebody else? Yep. He doesn't know Cousins. He doesn't know Jakovic. He doesn't know McKenna. He doesn't know Material. He's got no idea who they are. Now, this will be fun. And it's interesting with players just to set the scene about is if I'm not going to see him. Players sit in the same spot yeah. every time in a team meeting. I've asked netball girls and whatever. They sit in the same spot. They're 16 stones, sit in the front between Kelly and Dunkley. So I go through my matchups and some words of wisdom, some, some motivation, etc. And I say, Mick Lachlan, what do you know about Waterman? What do you know about McKenna? Short Maxfield, what do you know about David Hart? What do you know about Matera? I ask somebody else. And here's the big fella sitting in the front with his <laughs> elbows on his knees, his head in his hands, like the little boy in the English class that doesn't want to be picked out for reading. As if I couldn't see him. I said, Tone. <laughs> I always called him Tone out of respect and fear. I said, Tone. He said, yeah, mate. I said, what do you know about Braun? He said, his dad owns a shaver company. <laughs> 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 and we 
with, the, with, with that, he got up. He said, stick that up your backside and walk out of the room. Oh, that's great. <laughs> you mentioned one or two run-ins with him. Tell us about that. Um, well, one was about his groin um, in 97, which was, if you look back, quite infamous. He had a really bad groin. And people say he didn't want to train. But we'd heard that he'd been running 6 or 7K at night on a Wednesday night. So I spoke to him about it and said, oh, and he plays along with you for a while about anything. And then eventually he gets to a tipping point and he said, shut up. He said, the physios and the sports scientists got no idea what they're talking about. I know my body and I'm bloody running. What are you going to do about it? I said, well, there's not much I can do, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I just want to, you're such a valuable player, I just don't want to wreck you by the weekend. That's all we're trying to help you with. Okay. And that, that was it. The other one was... Um, <laughs> We played, in the start of 97, we played Port Adelaide in Port Adelaide, and we won, I don't know, eight points, ten points. And Tony kicked three goals, five, or kicked four, whatever it was. And um, Peter Philandia kicked five. And anyway, so I came down the back of the rooms at at, um, at, at Westlakes, and they come in the front. Everyone's happy. And I said, well done. And, um, and I see Tony sulking a bit. So I walked down, what's the matter? He said, oh, I'm just... Pissed off, you know. I should have kicked eight. He put the, all this mm-hmm. pressure on himself. And mass, the bloke got playing on wasn't that great. I should have kicked eight. I said, yeah, but you've kicked four. You've given four. You did give four away. I don't care. I said, it's a trouble with you. Nothing but. A, I said, enjoy the win. It's nothing. You know, bloody big, and bloody selfish so and so. And I went, oh shit, what did I say that for? Oh. His eyes are rolling, and I'm going, <laughs> like the courageous winger I was. I went down the <laughs> other side of the <laughs> other side of the room, and then um, on the Monday, um, all chirpy and said, come here, mate. He said. I'm not bloody selfish, all right. I said, I know you're not, mate. I know you're not. <laughs> it was a slip of the tongue. <laughs> so I went out of the chat, and he was all right. I said, just explained. Him. I said, it's about the team winning and wait. You no, know, the way you contributed was fantastic. You know, you're involved in eight goals. And he got up and he said, all fine, all smiles. He said, but I'm not bloody selfish. I said, gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. So I fear for my life. <laughs> Don't use the S word ever again. Yeah, no. <laughs> You get to Sydney in that 96 season, it is just quite unbelievable. Because Barassi had sort of set it up nicely, but the way you took it to that next level was unbelievable. Walk us through the journey and that grand final. Yeah, yeah. obviously Ron had given the place um, some credibility um, in the city uh, as well. And uh, I think they just missed out the finals the year before. And, um, and he blooded some kids and then fortunately we were able to recruit... Stuart Maxfield, Craig O'Brien, and Kevin Dyson, which helped us, who were not superstars, but they're good mm-hmm. players. And um, Ruzi was there the year before as well, was Tony. Um, so there's, you know, it was set up that way. So we lost our first two games. First one, my first game was by 80 points in Adelaide. And then we lost to Fremantle at home, which no one lost to Fremantle in those days. So it was Oof, like. Pressure I'm like, was mounting. I'm like. Two games in. Well, what am I doing here? I'm like, <laughs> uh, I'll just start doubting yourself. And anyway. As luck would have it, the next week we played Collingwood and we were five goals down, quarter time, ended up winning the game. And then lucky to beat Richmond next week by a few points. Drew with Essendon, who were a really good side at the time. Then we went to Perth and lost to the Eagles. But I think that was the turning point. That game we lost by 10 points. They were probably the best side in the comp. And that game, and then we won 13 in a row. And um, so we you now you now the flooding took off, which wasn't by design as such. Even though uh, the players embraced that, it caught the opposition off guard. It, it's helped us, and then we won the first one against you guys, I think, mm-hmm. in '96, uh, uh, which was a good game. Um, and always, if I see Dutchy Holland every time, that Darren Creswell couldn't jump over a matchbox um, marked over the top of Dutchy Holland the goal square. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Believe it, yeah. And, uh, and Kreza didn't say anything either. No, no, he, he he's never very, liked yapping out there. He's very quiet, Kreza. <laughs> and um, but Tony didn't play the last home and away game, which we need to beat West Coast to finish top two, which we did, and then beat Hawthorne without Tony, and then had another week off with the and uh, and he came back from the preliminary final, which because he had the bad grind. So that was, I'm think testament to him. He kicked six in the grand final. He's got such a high. Pride level in his performance puts a lot of pressure on himself, and he was never going to play poorly in the grand final. So, I think the preliminary final he might have kicked a couple, but he kicked that point at the end. And there was questions in the box whether he's had the leg to be able to kick it. So he's kicked that you know, fifty-five or so, and uh, it was a bit. Uh, it was fairly euphoric. 
And that prelim, a lot of people identify that game and that win that really established the AFL in Sydney. When the pubs across the state were packed watching the Swannies and everything like that, it was such a landmark victory. Yeah, it was. And the stories we heard, you know, the pubs even around the ground had packed and you now they turned off rugby league to watch the Swans. And I think that was the time that they were accepted in the city as one of their own. Obviously, rugby league were trying to, through the media and that, to trying to circumvent us. But um, I think that was the really the acceptance of the of the Swans being as part of the Sydney fabric. You always respected the Swans because back then, TV-wise, the Sunday game was always the Swans. Yep. So, um, you know, even when I was sort of 15, 16, 17 on TV were the Sydney Swans. So you got to know their players more than others. So they started to build and build and build, but then obviously be able to take them to the finals and get that momentum going, probably felt like you almost had the keys to the city. Um, yeah, <laughs> I suppose you might, but you never really were going to take over rugby league as such. But I think just the acceptance within the city, I think the players were, you know, it was a good group. Um, and I think, you know, we exceeded our own expectations. You no, know, even the, the season campaigners there was like, you know, it was a bit one out of the box that everything, everything fell into place. Um, and I think from that year up until now, I think, the Swans have only missed the final three times mm. in that it's at, uh, nearly 30 years. So Unbelievable. 26 years. So so they've done a pretty good job. Tell us about 2002 when it all came to an end. Yeah, I got the sack. What do you want to know? Is that during the year? Like, or, yeah, yeah. I, I got, it, spoke, it, I got spoken to that, listen, we're not going to renew your contract. Right. Uh, and if people say, or well, the coach will say, oh, no, no, they're just not going to renew my contract. Well, you're sacked. It's the end of story. It's, it, but, there's no other way around it. But it's a, it's a tough job because you know I'm going to go and coach, but you know that pretty much everyone gets sacked. That's yeah. the way the coaching... It, yeah, it does. There we go around um, the world. Happens, and then, yeah. as you said, with you know they didn't renew your contract. So it's like, so, well... So they told me job. about six weeks to go or something. And I said, well, there's no sense really coaching because they know that I won't be here and yep. it doesn't help the players, doesn't help the club. Um and always, even even my dad, but certainly Hawthorne was all about club first, so uh, it's best I moved on. So. And were you shattered or were you thinking, OK, I did really well here, freshen up and go again at another team? How were you looking at it at the time? Uh, I think, as as Shane said, you know, you know that you're realistic, you know it's going to end. Even, oh, what, I was 40-odd that stage, you're still naive about the politics in the background. You know, you hear about it, but until you're a victim of it where... People are nice to your face, but they're actually saying other things. Yeah, and, 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 that, and that's a disappointment. Like, how do you, how do you deal with it? Because that's that's one of my biggest pet hates. Is like you go right, we're all in, but then you've got a board and all this talk and and, and leaks that get out from there yeah. into the media. You're like, hang on, we're, we're all meant to be together. You're, we're all meant to have each other's backs. We're all meant to be heading in the one direction. Yet. You've got people, you know, talking behind your back. So yeah. I can't mentally cope with that. I'm like, do you know what? If we're not all in this together, yeah. including yeah. board yeah. and direction, yeah. you know, we're in big trouble. Yeah. And that's, you know, there's a few administrators and they'd, you hear things that, I mean, just come and say, listen, you're really struggling. Anything we can do to help, but I don't know how it's going to be at the end of the year. I don't know what I'm going to, whether they think that certain people can't handle that. And they're what that person is going to say, and that may be their view. But certainly, from my point of view, you no, know, I give direct feedback. I like direct feedback. So just mm-hmm. let me know where we're at. Okay, and we'll work out the best solution and going forward. So, you know, you're reading the tea leaves. You hear some things. So, looking back, what I was saying was the right thing, but I wasn't a good stress carrier at the time. So the players could tell that I was under stress, and uh, the way I was saying things rather than what I was saying. And I think with those words in the background that was adding to that instead of being able to alleviate that pressure and stress stress and pressure and say listen you're probably not going to survive but anything we can do to help what do we think we can do to do okay the, you know what we're looking for is the best for the team and the best for the club you look back on that swans era it's so successful you really put them on the map what are you the most proud of um i think that coming into a even though they'd been there Oh, five or six years, I suppose, a bit... Oh, no, a bit more. But ten or... No, that's right, 14, 15 years. Yeah. Um, and they were pioneers and they did a great job. I think being able to set a foundation, um, obviously the finals that we played, I think four out of seven or five out of seven or whatever it was, um, but be able to set a foundation and, and start with the culture about what the what the, what the the bloods are about. Um, so I, I think more of that. 
uh, than anything. Um, what and what about the SCG? Because it's unusual. Every time we used to play at yeah, the SCG, it, it was hard. Like the the centre half forward and the half forwards would complain. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, we can't get our running patterns going, and you know our defenders, we just couldn't work it all out. No. So it was a bit of an advantage, wasn't it, there for a while? Oh, for sure. And I think when I first started coaching, I knew that players play in their positions. Half forward flanks play half forward flanks. The uh, fifty arc is never fifty. At no, the it's SCG. forty. It's forty five or something. Yeah. So and, and that throws and, you and, out of whack. And kicking to centre half forward is a dangerous spot because it's turnover. It's back the other way. So. With the way we played, was more about players get up the ground and not play your position. So we weren't really worried about position. So we try and, and everyone went man on man. It was a man on man game. So I started to throw blokes behind the ball and they just get followed. And we'd have 10 behind the ball and have four in the, three in the forward line. And Tony's got so much space. So it wasn't until later that the team started to work out okay, there's no sense following these guys. Um, so you start to tag players behind. So you wouldn't play position. So we'd start to open up. I think if you play in the SCG, play a traditional game, which they don't anymore, it was really disadvantageous. I think you need to be able to get your players up and create some space where your leading patterns are more figure eight across the ground rather than up and down. Mm. How do you think uh, Plugger would go with, you know, not necessarily today, but the last few years where lots of zoning, pushing back, extra numbers all around, knowing that the ball can't actually get to him initially. He might, he might have cleared out a few. He might have been reported a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the way with the, the match for you, who offers it does today. I think he might have he might have been for a little tap because he, he, he was fairly aggressive. Because we did a bit of training when I first went, first went there about having a spare in front of him. He loved killing. He, yep. he, he hurt his teammates. He really wanted to just <laughs> fall. Get out of my space. So so we actually tried to practice that for him to get used to that and have some different mechanisms. So which around. player did you use at that time? <laughs> well, it was Darren Gasper before he oh, went to, before he went to Richmond. That's why he left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why he went. He's like, shit, I'm, I'm hate training. <laughs> I'm out of here. Now, the end of the 2004 season, you're like a young, young Shane Crawford at a nightclub, just interest from everywhere, because there's vacancies at Richmond, Hawthorne, the Western Bulldogs and Adelaide. Tell us about how you got to the dogs. Um, yeah, I um, was spoken to by Richmond with Greg Miller and David Parkin, and I thought it was a chance through Greg, because I knew Greg from North, but they'd already made their mind up, and David Parkin agreed uh, said that was the fact later. So anyway, and then uh, there's a few coaches who didn't want to get interviewed by Adelaide because I thought it was Neil Craig was over the line, but I'm not like that. You just, oh well, I'll go for the job. Um, they were reasonably impressed and it was to and fro for a while. Then Neil ended up getting that. And um, then um, the, spoke, the Bulldogs, but Hawthorne hadn't spoken to me at that stage and I was procrastinating a bit and you hear some things from people that I knew there. And um, then Dermot flew to Sydney and spoke to me on a Thursday and said, oh, no, I would like you to coach. He said, I'm mates with some other guys, but I don't think... But I said, well, mate, I'm actually going to Melbourne on the weekend to be interviewed by the Bulldogs. And if they tick some boxes, I'll accept the job if they offer me. I'm, I'm not going to be emotionally say, so play one off against the other. All oh, right, OK, I'll get the thing, because I think it was going to be the week after. And so I had a call from Hawthorne. No, it wasn't even Hawthorne. I think Dermot phoned me back and said, oh, it can be Monday. So it was a bit higgledy-piggledy mm-hmm. from Hawthorne, to be yeah. honest. And um, I don't think they were they were down the path. They were just taking their time and thought, one of the old boys will want to coach us and they'll keep them on well, hold. I think they were trying to work out what to do. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. It was a bit uh, lost at that time. Then I went for an interview on the Sunday at uh, in the city somewhere, in, in Collins Street, I think it was, up the top end. And... Um, uh, Robert Walls, Jose Romero, Campbell Rose was CEO, and there was someone else. And um, they offered me the job. They said, We don't there want to. There and lead. then. I said, We don't want to. No, it's, have to go and sit in an office for a while. And then they came back and said, well, We don't want to leave the building, get your manager in. And they offered me the job. And because the questions I wanted, it wasn't anything to do with money, because I probably could have got more money. But it was more to do with where they saw their list what they thought of development going forwards with the facility, et cetera, et cetera. So they ticked about, and I was happy with that. I thought their vision was good, so I accepted that. I'd already spoken to Collingwood about taking the Director of Coaching uh, through Ed, um, so I had to phone Ed. <laughs> had to phone the great, arrogant one, Jason Dunstall, <laughs> and, um, who was at a CEO's meeting because he was acting CEO at the yep. time, 
and left a message for him, but never got a return call back, which is always Jason's <laughs> want. And so, um, yeah, I accepted the Bulldogs, and I never got interviewed by Hawthorne. I never, never spoke to anyone from So there. what excited you about the Bulldogs? Because at the time, it was a challenging period for the club. There was going to be yeah. a lot of work for you. Yeah, I think their age profile, um, which I've got a good story about in a minute, and um, and they, they were fairly realistic about where they thought they were at after a couple of... And they were organised, obviously, with the meeting. You know, yes, and, like, and, hey, and, and they were impressive the way they, yeah. they spoke about it. And they asked some really good questions and, um, and they had a vision about having the facilities, which they actually, uh, three years down the track, they got up and going. Um, so it might have been two years. But um, so, yeah, it, it, it ticked a few boxes. Um, or ticked the boxes I thought more about the footy and, and, and about where they saw they were going. Um, they were a fairly young squad. Had five players who'd played over 200 games, but the rest were really young. Um, so I thought there was some growth opportunities there, even though I didn't know a lot about them. Tell us about the story then with the age profile. Well, when I went to, uh, yeah, as I said, I didn't know a lot about them. And uh, when I saw them, when I met them, how skinny they were. And I heard they hadn't done weights for quite a few years. And so there's a lot of physical development left in, in them as well. So. So I thought, oh, well, we'll do some training Saturday mornings as well, just some football games, you know, handball games, some small-sided games, just to so I can get a feel what they're like. And um, so one Saturday morning, uh, we had 40 players, of course, and I said, oh, can the senior players go to my left? Can the rest of the players go to my right? I just want to get an idea mentally where they saw themselves. So I had five players that played 200 games. Eight went to my left. Robert Murphy had played 60, went to my right. So I would expect 40 players to go to my left. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you haven't played a senior game. You're playing the elite sport. And I went, oh, wow. I said, oh, shit, guys, we're not enough, enough players to play on the weekend. We've only got eight <laughs> players. Oh, we didn't understand the question. So that's – and I thought, you had your game plan, which because it was a flood in Sydney, it was more defensive base, as most coaches do. And I thought, we've got a bigger issue here. We, you know, we've got a confidence level. We've got a, an issue of confidence that they don't believe that they belong their self-esteem. So I didn't know how I was going to build that because it's very easy for coaches to say, oh, don't worry about mistake changes. But yeah. in the heat of the moment, you're going to say, well, what did, you, what did you do that for? And all of a sudden, it gets back it gets back the other way. So um, over the next couple of months, I realised that they could kick the ball well. They had good skills and they were quick. So the old 20-metre um, sprint test, when I was playing at Hawthorne, David used to do it parking under the stopwatch. There was three of us, I think. Under three seconds, um, the Swans. There were seven. There was twenty-one. Yeah, the right. was there really? Wow. So I thought, got speed, and they've got some. They can kick the ball. They're skinny. Okay, let's get the game plan around what they can do rather than what they can't do. Most coaches build from defence first. It was a bit the other way. Okay, let's let's back what what we've got in our positives. So we how we modify the game. The number of wouldn't work today because of the because of the zone defence. But the number of bounces averaged per team was about four and a half a game. We went to forty four per game, run and carry the footy. So just back yourself, take the game on. And probably your best player was probably the slowest, Scotty West. Yes, you know he was, but he was but, a ball magnet. But with that, he was able then to direct the ball he, mm. rather than just kicking a straight line. He was able to back his agility around it and get himself free and extricate, be able to do something with the footy. So. We, um, we were 6-10 and 10 after 16 games, but I was happy with the development. And then the last six games, we won five of them. We lost to Melbourne with Jeff White kicked a goal on the siren, and we missed out to Melbourne by half a game, making the finals. So to me, the confidence has ticked off. Uh, then we started to modify the game plan, started getting a bit more size, started to improve our contested ball, et cetera, et cetera. Out of all your achievements in footy, getting that Bulldogs team to prelim finals in 2008, 2009, 2010, could you make a case that's the gold medal winner? Certainly would have liked to have gone at least another step. Um, I think 2009 was the year that we could have, should have, um, at least get the grand final. Uh, yeah, I, I think I enjoyed my time the most at the Bulldogs no doubt, because of the way the club is. The players were a fantastic group to coach and be involved with and I think they all grew up together and as far as you know, similar ages, and then we added to that Cooney and Griffin and a few other blokes along the way. Um, yeah, I think because when I first went there, you know, I wanted the players to own the team, uh, about them to have a say and about the values and all that sort of stuff that we do. And they just didn't know what I was talking about. It was like, and then Murph and Jerry come up and said, 
listen, Rocket, that's all well and good. Can you just teach us how to win? We just want to win. Just want to, in other words, just coach us. So it was a it was a, a phase of being able to get their confidence and coach them at the same time, giving them some responsibility and some ownership of the team. And that eventually came to about that time, 2006 and seven, then eight, nine and 10, we actually... Put, so answer your question, yeah, probably. Yeah, probably, yeah. Tell us about Adam Cooney. Oh, he's a different cat, Coons. <laughs> uh, I, I said to Coons, he goes, is... Even when he was drafted, he, he sort of had that look about him as like, OK, we're going to have to really crack the whip with him. Well, he, he was there the year before me and he, he said publicly that he was a little bit pudgy and overweight and didn't like training too much and then he got himself fit. I, I said to him one day, because he was really popular, you know, the guys really liked him and he had a great sense of humour. Um, but I think he liked, and I said to him one day, I said, it's OK to show some emotion that you care. I said... I think you're trying not to care, to show that you're not to care. It's like you get mm-hmm. perception. He said, oh, how did you pick that? So it was right. And I said, it's okay to show that you care sometimes. And you, know, you might not so much get angry, but you get down or you want to get up and about for your teammates. Um, so we understood that. But he, I think it was a real shame that he, you know, that he fractured his kneecap because he'd won the Brownlow fractured his kneecap, and he was never really the same player after that. And I think he would have grown to become a really excellent, consistent player. He was just a kid um, when he first got there, and he was learning the professionalism of the game. At the same time, he was a bit of the free spirit, which is fine. You don't want to take that out of him. You want him to back his ability. But I think he was becoming more of a leader as, as he went on, but it was just unfortunate with his knee. You had some characters at the Bulldogs during that time as well. Who were some other ones that stand out? Oh, yeah, they were funny. Um, they, like all footy clubs, they love playing tricks on each other and that sort of stuff. But, uh, Lindsay Gilby was, was, was funny. Mitch Hahn. Barry Hall, when he came, fitted in really well. He was hiding players' cars and parking them in the gym and they couldn't find them. <laughs> so you're not going to argue with Barry, are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I had a blue with Barry one day. But I really get off really well with Barry. He's a, he's a good fella. But he, um, <laughs> they, uh, yeah, he is a, he's a big man, Baz. Um, but they, yeah, I just love Playing. All 40 40 clubs are very similar like that. I remember my, my Murph always reminds me, I said the Shane Burr story, but um, when I first got there, that Daniel Bandy was playing for the Bulldogs. It was my first year. So he's six foot six and can run athletic. Didn't have a great vision of the game. Like he just didn't see, just, you know, see ball, get ball, and then just run and whatever happens. And we're playing one day at the MCG and we must have lost. And DB got the ball at centre half back. Because he can run, he got the ball, like Brian Lake, he slows down. And he's looking around, and he gets tackled. So after the game, I go through a few blokes, not didn't give him a spray, Shane. But <laughs> so, so, I said, DB, why did that happen that one at centre half back? I said, Ray Charles would have seen him coming. <laughs> 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 and Murphy, and the boy started laughing. So, just, uh, so um, yeah. Just that, run, uh, mate. Get the ball and run. Yeah. You know, use take your it Take the grass. Yeah, yeah. Back yourself. Tell us about your blue with Barry Hall, because if I don't ask that question, people are going to say, what happened, what happened, what happened? Um, well, it was. It was you, you, you remember the game against North Melbourne when he choked Scott Thompson to death. Mm. And, um, Accidentally. Yeah, and I'm in the box. Get him. I said to him, Send him a runner, Brendan. I said, get him off. I said, will you get him a bit like the yep. Will you get him off? Because I didn't want him to lose a flight and get... And then Barry let him go, and then he's got the elbows above the ears as he's walking off. And I said, get him inside. Get him in the rooms. Get the cameras off him. And I went in, and I, I was <laughs> calm when I spoke to him. I said, mate, I'm just trying... He said, if I lose it, you'll know I lose it. And I was totally in control. I said, no worries, Baz. <laughs> <laughs> And you were about 15 goals up that day, weren't you, too? Oh, I can't remember. I think we were in front, but I know it was 15. Oh, <laughs> there we go. Well, you've, you've dealt with Lockett and Hall. Maybe you should run courses on just how to deal with <laughs> but these. not only that, Brian Lake as well, you know, so you've got to throw him in yeah. the mix. He's a bit left field. But uh, you've got the big guys, the big, strong guys, you know. And after doing so well at the Bulldogs, you finish your AFL coaching career by going back to the Gold Coast Suns from 2015 to 2017. At times when you were there, did you think, geez, I've gone back to the Bears in the late 90s? Oh, when I first got there, yes, exactly. I, uh, the facilities were ordinary, but they've got, they've got great facilities now. Um, but just because uh, as years have, go on, have gone on, the professionals and players have has increased and the demands of clubs, and I think maybe we've go too far, as you were talking earlier about actually relaxing um, you know, the pressure and intensity on players. And... Um, but 
they're doing some basic kicking drills, and they're just walking, just kicking it, and it's like it, like in the country park, <laughs> and things off field, and guys, alcohol and drugs, and you go, jeez, what have we got here? Like it was just really. So you're, you're starting from scratch, and then we got a lot of injuries. I remember one game, our first six midfielders weren't available, so it was Ablett, Swallow, Prestia, Bennell, um can't remember who else. There was the first six weren't playing. So it was like, well, you get some injuries. So there has to be something in that. So, yeah, yeah, it was, it was frustrating. Gary Ablett, one of the best we've ever seen. What was he like to coach? He was terrific, Gaz. Like, he, I think he... I think he gets criticised for his captaincy, so I've gone the captaincy first, because of who he is and how good he is, and he's a different character. Like, he's he's not a Luke Hodge, and he's not a Michael Voss, and he's not in your face. And us as the public or media like that, think that's the way to be a captain. Um, he's he, he does lead by example. People say, you know, he doesn't lead by example like Hodge or... But he was a great contested ball player, so he had to be tough mm. to win the contested ball. He was fantastic at being able to win contested so he was tough enough. He was a great educator. He would spend time with players and try and help them, the body use and kicking the ball and vision. So he had a lot of boxes ticked. He, he probably wasn't a confrontational guy, so he was never going to have a tough conversation with a, a player. Now, whether that's – and probably as a leader, you need to probably have that element. You were captain for a while. Did you have – um, have to have a co- tough conversation. Were you comfortable with that? Well, not really. No. no, but we, yeah, we had many conf- uh, at the time too. You know, conversations that would really rattle people. Yeah. You know, and then I had some good coaches who were really strong on the yeah the those confrontational discussions as well. But um, yeah, it was never easy. I was more okay. Lead by example. Train, I'd, I'd, train I'd, as you play that yeah. type of stuff. And, but and, yeah, um, you know, Gary Ablett, he he got. I suppose the criticism. With him later on in his career, oh, he's not playing with injury, you know, which was always, uh, I don't really know because I wasn't in, in, mm. in the sanctum, but from what I know of him as a player, he did. He went and won his own footy, you know. Yeah. He, con- he was a, an amazing, consistent player. Yeah. It was just, you know, as you said, you had a lot of older players fixing gaps. You had a lot of injuries when you were there. You had a club that was virtually restarting from scratch, bit pretty much like the Brisbane Lions, yep. uh, Brisbane Bears. When, yep. Yep. when It's a tough job. You know, yep. you look at you look at the Giants now, still haven't won a flag, no. you know. Yep. Fremantle haven't won a flag, no. you know, and then how long have they been going? Yeah, so that's right. Yeah, it takes a while. It takes a long time. I think um, I think with Gaz, he, he, he was never really the same player after the operation yep. the year before I got there. So, and he got a frozen shoulder a couple of times, which happens. And Gaz wasn't big on painkillers. He just didn't want his body to be at 40 years of age, um, be able to play through that sort of... Which is fair enough. I mean, that's that's his decision. And so he was... He waxed and waned a little bit with his body. He never had the consistency, I think, on the field. He played some terrific games up there, uh, but he did miss some games. Um, but he was very professional. He led by example. He was like... Shane was a captain. He... I don't know whether as a captain you need to have those tough conversations. Paul Kelly wasn't... Wasn't big on that either, even though he was a tough player. So, I think he got criticised unfairly by some people in the in the Melbourne media here, and uh, because he was obviously fantastic for the club. But then in the end, he wanted to go back to Geelong. That was where he wanted to finish, and I think that was fair enough as well. I don't think anyone could begrudge him that he no. did such a good job up there. Now you coached three hundred and seventy seven AFL games. Can you pick out two or three players that you really enjoyed coaching? They might not have been the superstars, but you just you felt like you got the best out of them, and they were really receptive to your coaching. Um, I liked Ryan Griffin as a player. He was a good player. He was a, he was a terrific player, Griff. And Gary Ablett, uh, unbelievable. You know, some of his games were just out of this yeah. world. You, you got to see it all, really, because you had, you know, front row seat, plug a locket. You got to I, play with Warwick Kappa. You know, you got to play with Dermot yeah, and Jason like, Dunstall. And, and I think the best player I've seen is Lee Matthews. So, probably your point, I mean, the best players I've coached is probably Plugger and Kelly. Yep. Uh, Brad Johnson, West. The players I like, as a coach, and all coaches the same, even if a coach has got some flair and anything, and I like blokes with, to express themselves, you know, you like guys who get the most out of themselves. Dale Morris was one of my favourites. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I remember the Bulldogs, so it was, it, it was my first year. I never heard of Dale. So he couldn't play under 18, he never made an under 18 squad, never got picked, got cut. 
played for a do to stars out in the Essendon district lead, then went to Werribee and was just playing the back pocket at Werribee. And because Werribee was an affiliate with the Bulldogs, their seconds played there, our spare players played there, Leon Cameron and and Chris Bond said, I think we should get him and train with us as a rookie. They liked him because he was tough and And we didn't have any money. We had no money. It's the same with Liam Picken. Good story. No money to to pay rookies. So we we I went and we went and sourced some um So you handed spons- over a big wad that you were getting. Oh, from yeah, the that's coach. what's the one. <laughs> <laughs> um so we got some sponsors and they paid half. If the, so so Williamstown paid half of Liam Pickens. Yep. And we got half uh, from from some guys who tipped in. We got Dale Morris and Liam Pickens just just wow. like that. So the rookie list. So Dale his first game played on I remember we played Adelaide. He played on Rashudo. Um, and Goodwin and beat them at halfback flank. So he had some of the biggest, best jobs. Like he used to smash Eddie Betts and Stephen Milne, yep. and he was six foot three, quick. Then he'd play on Rewalt and Pavlich. Yeah. Like he was a super. He's probably your first pick, really, when you oh, think about it. It's just, like, okay, should, what job are we going to give you him? You just know that he was going to do it. Yep. I've only probably only seen him get beaten twice. Stevie Johnson beat him, um, and there was another game I can't remember, but. Which is un, unheard of for a defender. He, you just knew what he was going to do. Mm. It wasn't a great kick, but he knew his limitations. That's what you always say as a coach to a player. If you're not a great kick, just stick to your limitations, and you'll end up being a good kick because yep. you're reliable. Yep. When you play outside your capabilities, that's when you bugger up. I've seen so many blokes who try to kick the knife of a needle. They've told they're not a great kick, so they want to rectify that by being the best kick, and they stuff it up every well, time. That, well, that's the Josh Gibson scenario. Come from North Melbourne, come to Hawthorne. Just pass it on. Yeah, it just, just pass it on, and all of a sudden he becomes a best and fairest winner at all Australia. Yeah, like yeah. obviously great with defending, but you know, kept it simple. Pass yeah. it on. Yeah, they'll do the rest for me. That's the art of coaching is to get these players to believe that whatever your weakness is, or not a strength, don't make it a two out of ten. Make it a five or a six out of ten, and keep, don't aim for a ten. Then you can play to your strengths because your your things you're not great at is not going to be a weakness. You're a proud Tasmanian. If Tassie had an AFL team, would you participate in that? And do you think they should have a team? Uh, they should have a team. Hopefully they haven't missed the, the jump. What are we going to we, call them? The Tassie what? Oh, it's always going to be something. You know, the, the Devils. Devils. Oh, the, the, I mean, they've had the Devils before, whether that's the Tassie Devils, Tassie Tigers. The Jack Jumpers have, have, yeah, have stolen the march, haven't they? So, because participation is down, and you worry about the future of footy in Tassie. Uh, it's been a heartland, but... It's not Heartland anymore, and I think the AFL may have missed the march. Um, the my old team Glenorchy has been one of the strongest and biggest catchment of players. They can't field an under 18s and struggle to field a seconds team. Jeez, and they're in the state league. So if that's so, therefore to me, AFL Tasmania have not done a good thing with development and keeping the game the way it is. So having a, an AFL team is not going to fix all the ills. Just plonking a team there or starting it up is going to have some real benefits, A, for the economy and then uh, pathways, etc. But they've got to really drill down to suburban footy, statewide league, um, country league. Now, country teams are folding like they are in here in Victoria as well, but they've really got to get to help these communities and people and therefore we will see benefits come back the other way because they'll be involved in footy and buy merchandise and go to games, etc., etc. And I think, yeah, they need a team, Um Love to be involved, yeah, in some way. Yeah, no, yeah. Love to help in any way. Robert Shaw's doing a fantastic job in the background. So I talked to Shory a bit. Uh, but the task force that have come up with it have done a great job. AFL Tasmania won't talk to them. So there's there's still this disconnect about how it's going to unfold. And I think uh, that's part of the AFL job. If they get a team there, they need to get all parties together and what's best for Tassie footy. And when I think of Tasmanian players... It's some of the all-time greats. Peter Hudson, obviously someone you know very well. You've got the Revolts. Uh, well, it was Jumpin' Jack. Anyway, he came down and trained with uh, the Hawks, and he was probably about 16. Nick, Nick, was we 12, Nick was 12 when he left. Yep. And he went to Queensland. But Matty the, Richardson, uh, Grant Birchall, yeah, one, one the of best, the finest. The best four have always, they've always say is Bulldog, Stewart, Royce Hart, and Hudson. Yep. In the best four. Then you got Alistair Richardson. Lynch. And then you got Richardson and Lynch, Brent Croswell, and then there's probably the next next group after that. Um, but yeah, there's been a, you know it's been a great Darren project. Pritchard. Oh, we can't yeah. forget Darren Pritchard. Darren Pritchard. What a player he was. So now there's now there's been a very fertile ground uh, for for recruiting for and Tasmania. good people. 
Like we are. Tasmania, like obviously, spent a lot of time with Hawthorne down there. Really, just good. salt of the earth, good yep, people. Yeah, yep. blue collar, hard working, good people, good state, a really good state. Yeah. So hopefully they do get one, and um, you know the former premier who was a very strong part of it and was a very strong advocate. Um, so hopefully the new premier's the same. But said they build the new stadium, which will be roof over, so the elements in a good spot. They where definitely need the roof. <laughs> <laughs> well, at Bell Reeves, the wrong place. Yep. Bell Reeves, no good for footy or cricket. It's windy, it's on a hill, it's, it's and they're made into Antarctica a cricket Antarctica down the road. Just down the road, <laughs> the, the, the blowy as all hell. I mean, you know, you've seen some of the, the games here in North Melbourne, the ball goes back, they kick it and goes back over the head. Yeah. Like, <laughs> just, just can't play footy there. Now, Rodney, we've loved having a chat. Let's finish with a few quick fire ones. Favourite footy memory? Ooh. Grand finals, premierships. One in particular, does one stand out? Yeah, 86. What made 86 special? Uh, you didn't play 85. I didn't play 85, got dropped, and then lost the Norm Smith by a vote. And you were robbed too. I was. Teddy Wynn got you, didn't he? Yeah, I. In every paper and and radio and TV, oh, no. I was the best player. So I keep telling Ezzy when I have lunch, and I said, <laughs> mate, you brought along my Norm Smith for me. <laughs> best sledge you ever heard on a footy field? Uh, gee, I, I can't. No, I can't remember one, honestly. No. Best I, spray you ever gave? Best spray. And we'll take Will Minson out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't give him a spray. No, I know. <laughs> well, you gave the runner a spray. See, he didn't receive that. Um, Brian Lake. Yeah, probably Brian. <laughs> probably Brian. <laughs> Rodney, we've loved having a chat. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Good to be here. Thank you, Croft. Well done, Rodney. Thanks very much, Shane. And punish you've been listening to Tabs Inside 50. Yeah.